Good afternoon. Welcome to worship today as we gather around our God's word for our second Lenten midweek service. As we continue to uh, meditate on our Savior's redemption and this Lenten season, we're going through sections of Ezekiel. Uh, tonight we'll be following the order of service printed for you in your bulletin, and our opening hymn is hymn 409, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary. May the Spirit of God richly bless your worship today. Please stand. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. The Lord be with you. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins, speak to our hearts, dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word, and receive our hymns of thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Let our prayers be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in our time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy, now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll join together to sing Psalm 4 in the front of your hymnals. One thing to note is that in the refrain of Psalm 4, there's two lines of text. There's the regular type and then a line of text in italics. Uh, we'll sing the regular type for the refrain. Lord, do not remember the sins of our youth and our rebellious ways. Remember instead the great mercy and love that you have shown your people for hundreds of generations. Forgive our sins and teach us to live lives of integrity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll now hear an anthem from the Junior Choir, hymn 423. The congregation is invited to join in the fourth stanza.
A reading from the Passion History of Our Lord. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. This is the Passion History of Our Lord. We'll join together to sing hymn 813.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what comes to mind first when you hear the word temple? I'm guessing most of us as Bible-believing Christians think of that Old Testament building, house of worship in Jerusalem, where God's people would gather together, required three times a year to show up at the temple for worship, to offer their sacrifices and, and prayers. They did that for nearly a thousand years, worshiping first for 350 some years at Solomon's temple. And then after they came back from exile, as we'll talk about in today's message, for another 600 years. Or maybe you're thinking about how Paul in his letter to the Corinthians talk of, talks about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus used it in that way. Maybe you remember as part of the Lenten readings when Jesus was on trial in front of the Sanhedrin, they brought forth the guys accusing him and two of them said, well, we heard this guy say, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. And they were thinking of that building there in Jerusalem. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. But like I said, for over a thousand years, the temple in Jerusalem played the primary role in the worship life of God's people. And that included those exiles living in Babylon early in the 6th century before Christ. In the year 597, the Babylonians had come for the second time to impose their will over the Jews living in Judah and Jerusalem. And at that point, they carried about 10,000 Jews away into exile, especially those who played a prominent role in the society of that day and in business and education and, and the military. And they had been resettled in Babylon. But their hearts and their thoughts often turned back to that temple in Jerusalem where many of them still had friends and, and relatives uh, still living. But there in Babylon, along the banks of the Kibar Canal, God had called a priest named Ezekiel to be his spokesman. And we are studying, well, over the course of 20 years, Ezekiel had 14 different visions and we're studying a number of those in our midweek devotions this year. We're studying those messages, seeing how they apply to the people of Ezekiel's day there in exile, but also how they relate to 21st century Christians as we look at, under a microscope during the season of Lent, our relationship and the meaning of Christ's suffering and death for us. Now, the first 13 of Ezekiel's visions over a six-year period, well, they were meant to drill into the hearts, uh, the hearts of those exiles exactly why they were where they were. It was because they had desecrated the Lord's temple. They had set up, many of their, 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 their kings were idol worshipers, who had set up altars to the false gods right in the courtyard alongside the altar of burnt offerings on which the daily sacrifices to Jehovah were offered. Could you imagine having a, 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 an idol of Buddha up in front here? Or some of the Hindu gods? Well, that's what some of those kings of Israel had done, those kings right in the temple of the Lord. And that blatant idolatry showed their betrayal in their relationship to the Lord. And so a, in a series of stern messages, from the Lord given through Ezekiel to these exiles, God was calling them to repent. Repent of their spiritual adultery, saying that they were committing spiritual prostitution in their worship of those false gods. <clears throat> that call to repentance, well, that's the primary focus of our messages this Lenten season. But today, we're going to jump to the last message, a little out of order. Last nine chapters of Ezekiel's message. 
given about 20 years after his first message. It was now 13 years after a third rebellion by the Jews back in Judah and Jerusalem. And at that time, the Babylonians had had enough. In 586, they burned and looted and destroyed the city completely. The temple was left, Solomon's beautiful temple. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world had been left as a pile of rubble. And so Ezekiel's message now was telling those 10,000 who he had come with and many thousands more who came after that third captivity said, stop thinking about that temple. You're not going back there for quite a while. Don't think about fixing it up. You're here. Put down roots. Build your businesses. Plant crops. You're going to be here a while. But Ezekiel, in this last vision, speaks of a restoration, a new temple, one more grand, one that would last not just a few hundred years, but would last forever. This is not the temple they were going to rebuild when they got back after the end of the exile. Oh, as you read through these chapters, it sounds just like the one that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And we, you, you learn that it, it, it looks like the one that they rebuilt when they got back to Jerusalem in 530. But the one Ezekiel sees here in his vision is, is huge. It's more special than any earthly structure ever could be. In this vision, God's prophet sees the glory of the Lord coming back to his temple. He had seen, in one of his early visions, he had seen the glory of the Lord, you know, that the presence of the Lord in the pillar of cloud that had descended on the temple when Sol at Solomon's dedication of it. I, Ezekiel had seen that glory of the Lord depart. But now in this vision, he's, he's accompanied by an angel who shows him all the rooms and all the, the places where they, the people would gather, the courtyards and where the priests would do their thing, measure it all out. But then this man, angel, well, there's one more feature of the temple that he shows him. While the man was, this is verses, our text for today, 40, chapter 43, verses 6 to 7. While the man was standing beside me, I heard one, someone speaking to me from inside the temple. He said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. The people of Israel will never again defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings by their prostitution and the funeral offerings for their kings, the dead idols for their kings at their death. What's this all about? Whose voice was Ezekiel hearing? Who would be ruling and directing the affairs in this new temple? Well, this was going to be, strange as it may sound, a temple to live with his people. This temple is not, that, that Ezekiel sees, is not a physical structure, a holy place. Rather, it's a person whose presence is all about holiness. Remember Israel's mistaken belief that that temple, well, that's God's presence in our midst. That temple, we've got the temple there. God will never let anything happen to us. We're safe and secure as long as we got that building. And yes, it was the sign of God's presence among them. And God had promised that they were his people. But by their actions, what had they been showing for the last 150 years or so? They've been showing that the building was more important than the relationship they were to have with the Lord. And while there were many people who did revere the Lord among the exiles, by and large, the nation as a whole had fallen from God's grace. Daniel and his companions, they came in the first pretty small wave of exiles. 
Ezekiel and the other 10,000 or so had come in the second one and then hundreds, a couple hundred thousand in the third exile. Well, they gathered around Ezekiel, God's spokesman there in, in Babylon. They gathered to hear and to learn from him. They learned that they had been swept up in God's judgment on the nation. And with that temple taken away, all the Jews needed to learn that what really matters is faith and trust and love for the Lord. Lives rooted in obedience and thankfulness to their gracious God. And God gave them 70 years to learn those lessons in that exile. Those who returned in 535 probably had been children or maybe very young adults when they came into the exile. But they learned their lesson. Under the leadership, and you can read about it in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Ezra, they came back, those exiles, and re re they rebuilt the temple. And for many decades, a couple centuries, they followed the ways of the Lord. They were zealous in the worship of God again. But over time, many gradually slid away from the core truths of, of God as a loving and forgiving Lord. And by the time the Son of God came into the world, the big issue wasn't idolatry and immorality too much, but rather self-righteousness, like the Pharisees, or worldliness, wanting really nothing to do with God as the Sadducees were. It was all centered around the belief that a person could, could get into God's graces through their own obedience and, and by following the right rituals and rules. And so the vision Ezekiel is describing in our text is not really a building, but it's a picture of heaven where Jesus is at the center. Our relationship with God is not about walls and a ceiling. It's about what we're doing there. It's about knowing the one who was in this temple speaking to Ezekiel in this vision. The one who said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. It's all about him and our relationship with him, the work that he accomplished for us, what he's all done so that we can live in his presence, here in this life, but especially forever in eternity in that heavenly temple. So this temple, this temple that we are to be most concerned about is the body of Christ, where his cross and his crown are on display. And that's why we have these special services, especially during Lent, to be reminded of what it took to build that spiritual temple, to see and cherish what enables us to be part of the body of Christ. The physical temple that Jesus' enemies were so concerned about, that one in Jerusalem, that one would be gone about 40 years after Jesus died. But the temple we're concerned about is the God-man who left behind, left behind the mansions of heaven and took on human flesh and blood. Our focus is on the one who in his tremendous love for lost sinners like you and me offered his body on the cross. Instead of thousands of lambs and sheep and goats and cattle being sacrificed on the altar in the temple court, it was the sinless Son of God who offered that one perfect sacrifice on Calvary's cross, who became the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. That death put an end to the rituals and the rites of the Old Testament temple, symbolized when at his death, as we sang in the hymn, that curtain in the temple was torn in two, giving us human beings access, free access to our God. Through faith in Christ, we now are the priests serving him. We are part of God's family. We bear his holy name. We have the doors to God's heavenly temple thrown open to us through that precious gospel message, that message of love spoken and, and studied through that precious name of God applied to us in the waters of baptism. 
through the assurance of Christ's forgiveness received in consecrated bread and wine, we enter that temple. We strengthen the relationship we have with that temple. We daily live and breathe with Jesus in our hearts and in our lives. Yes, it's all about the relationship we have with God through Jesus' life and death and resurrection. That's what he came to do, and to teach, emphasizing that central message of the gospel that it's all about the relationship with God based on repentance and faith and love. And we become part of that temple. We enjoy an intimate union with Jesus as the Holy Spirit works in our hearts through the gospel. He is our temple. And that's why we say our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God dwells within us through the gospel, that this Holy One of Israel is our God. And when he's in our hearts, we're home. It's not about these walls and this building and all the places maybe where you've worshipped over the course of your lives. When I served the synod on the district mission board, or in my congregations, my congregation especially up in Rice Lake. Hayward, Wisconsin, you ever been to Peace in Hayward? They worshiped in a, the first year's log cabin where the American Legion held its meetings. My congregation in Rice Lake, the funeral home. On the mission board, started a congregation down in Terre Haute, Indiana, junior high school gymnasium. Lexington, Kentucky, conference room at the hotel. But it's all, it wasn't about the buildings. It's about the people. We dare not treasure the bricks and mortar over the relationship with Jesus that is created and strengthened where Christians gather together to worship Jesus. We are the body of Christ. We display that by gathering around Jesus and his message. Where two or three come together, he says, there he's with us. When we follow the command given through the writer to the Hebrews, to not give up meeting together. When we remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, treasuring and focusing on the word, when we come often to feast on his holy supper, we are worshiping at the temple, at the feet of him who's prepared a place for us in his heavenly kingdom. So dear friends, don't let your couch or your mattress, or your desk at work become your temple. Don't starve your soul by staying away from the one who invites you to partake of his body and blood. Remember, he's the bread of life. He's the living water. He's the gate, our entrance path to the eternal banquet feast of salvation. Come together with your fellow believers to enjoy the blessings of fellowship intimacy and encouragement that we share as members of the body of Christ. This is where we learn to cope with life's problems. This is where we learn to prepare ourselves for that new life that's waiting for us. Here's where we remember that Jesus' crown will one day be ours, where we remember that we will stand before that throne. We will enjoy the <coughs> gates of heaven, the place in heaven, where there's no need for Lights because the light shining from the temple, from the throne of God, where our Savior, the Lamb of God, resides. We'll be there. We'll be enjoying that new Jerusalem. That eternal temple will dominate the scene. That's what Ezekiel was seeing here in this vision. What the Apostle John describes for us in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation. Ezekiel's main point today is that, as I've said already a couple of times, it's not about the building called a temple or a church. It's all about the relationship we have with our Savior through his cross, his promise of comfort and peace, the hope that he gives with his promises of eternity with him, what we call that heavenly temple. So as we continue our series of looking at Ezekiel's visions in the weeks to come, especially his call to repentance. That's important. That's what Lent's especially about. But don't forget his message of peace 
and restoration, why he was suffering and dying. It's the same message we hear all year round, but don't take it for granted. Don't let coming to this place become routine or run of the mill or so treasured in this building that we can't worship any place else. Rather, relish your being in this place, no matter where that place is. Exercising it there. Exercising our faith as people of God as we worship that Lord and Savior every day in our personal lives, every week in special service that we come together as His holy Christian church. Come together to be renewed in that relationship we have with the one who is our temple. In the presence of Jesus, that is where Israel worships, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue on page 5 in our service folder as we sing the song of Mary. Please rise for prayer. In our prayers today, we include a prayer for our sister, Kathy Werner, whom the Lord called home this past week. In the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, and for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O Lord. For one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will, we pray, O Lord. For our public servants who work day and night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord for favorable weather and bountiful harvests, for clothing and food, 
for health of body, mind, and spirit, and for deliverance from all sin and every form of evil, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear For the faithful who have gone before us, who have shared with us your good news, whose souls are now at rest in your heavenly kingdom, we give you thanks, O Lord. In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. Amen. O Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer, Kathy, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. And we also join to pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn.
Good afternoon. Just a couple of announcements today. First, thanks to the kids for coming and singing for us today. Uh, also, we are going to call again for a seventh grade teacher for next year. That call meeting will be next Tuesday, the 14th, uh, at 6.30 p.m. So that'll be here at Good Shepherds, Tuesday, uh, the 14th. And then also, uh, related on Sunday, that Pastor Wessel has received a call to serve uh, in Michigan. Please keep him in your prayers. Also, Pastor Alfdenberg has received a call uh, to serve in Fremont, Wisconsin. So keep him in your prayers as well as he deliberates where to serve our God. And then finally, I have been told that there is enough food tonight for the potluck Lenten dinner uh, for everyone to come. So even if you didn't sign up, there's more than enough of food if you would like to come downstairs and eat dinner. And with that, may God richly bless your week. <laughs>